And yeah, isn't it, isn't it nice when it like lets you know that it's being yeah. recorded now? <laughs> I think I broadcasted it to the neighbors. I, hey, for me, it it always covers everyone's butts, so that way, like, no one knows if it's like not being recorded or something like that. Yeah, that's awesome. So today on the Outsiders Insiders podcast, I have with me Matthew Bronlewy. I always feel like I messed up your last name, so it's Bronlewy, right? Yeah, I think that that sounds good. I mean, that sounds as good as anybody in my family would ever say it, I think. Perfect. I always I always have such a like a phobia about messing people's names up because I always feel like that is like the greatest sign of disrespect. It's like, yeah, thank you so much. You say you love my work, but you can't even get my name right. <laughs> well, I mean, oftentimes I find that people who have difficult names think about that. I mean, you don't have a difficult name, so I'm kind of actually surprised that you take the care and attention to uh, a difficult last name you you would think i don't have a difficult last name but you would be surprised the people what yeah like i'll, I'll hey i'm jay putty jake jake pooty pooty pussy oh that's amazing wow. like literally like they they see my 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 name and it's jacob jake uh pooty puddy like with double d's or pussy and then the other way you say pussy, like, and I'm like, it's, it, wow. Like, so anytime I, like, I introduce myself, I'm always like, hey, uh, I'm Jay Putty, uh, like the silly kind. Like, that's always like my go uh, Yes. But I always try and like do that. That I, works. I feel like names are one of those things where it, it really is a great sign of respect if you get it right. Because like a lot of people can be like, oh my God, I love your work or I, I love what you do. And then like, they can't get your name right. And they can't really like tell what you actually do. They just know you do something. And I'm like, yeah. if, you take the, if you take the time to like, like tell someone you like their work and respect what they do, like the bare minimum you can do is get your, the name right. <laughs> well, good, good point. Good point. I like it. Oh, I appreciate it. I do. No, no problem. So Matthew, you are kind of uh, a legend behind the scenes, especially here in Nashville let people know like what your journey is like where did you start well how far back are we gonna go i've been, I've been around for a little while <laughs> Man, go, go back as far like start from the beginning you were born okay i was born yeah i i was born in dallas texas raised in kansas uh grew up on a wheat farm in the middle of kansas uh, it was really, I really appreciate my growing up years. At the time, uh, I, w you know, I wanted to go to the big city, wherever that was, you know, if that was LA, if it was New York, Nashville, wherever. Um, but looking back, it was a really great upbringing, really wholesome. Um, I, you know, I enjoy getting, I'm going back to Kansas, you know, for July 4th this summer with my family. It's going to be really fun. So went from there to Greenville College, which is just uh, east of St. Louis. Um, and there, uh, really the beginning of my music career kind of starts there because I helped start a band called Jars of Clay. Uh, Wait, Charlie, you, oh, like you, you started Jars of Clay? I, I did. I was one of the, the co-founders of the band. So my, my mom would be loving this right <laughs> now. <laughs> my, uh, uh, my roommate was a guy named Charlie Lowell, who I'm still friends with, uh, and, and he had, enough grace to put up with my dirty laundry and staying up all night and everything. And, and then, uh, the lead singer, Dan and the other guitar player, Steve were in the room next door. And so, yeah, our, it was my sophomore year and we started jars and, uh, I was only with jars for a short time, long enough to be a founder and long enough to have some songs with them and everything. But then I, I just knew, uh, I knew that wasn't kind of the life for me in terms of being on the road and everything. So, didn't take too many years before I found myself in Nashville um, writing songs and producing music. And so I've been doing that ever since. Very much a, very much a studio rat, as they would say. Yeah. What was one of your first, like, I know moving from Jars of Clay would probably be a cult. Like, I know you said, like, it wasn't for you. But what was, like, what was your first big, like, record or something like that you worked on when you moved to Nashville that you're like, okay, I know the, I know what I'm doing now is right. I made the right decision. Well, I don't think, I mean, <clears throat> you know, I wish I could say I had it all 
planned out and but it was it it was such a messy journey i you know at that time i didn't even know what production was i mean these days when somebody asks me what i do i actually say producer first uh and and really singer not singer songwriter songwriter would be kind of my first love but producing is is really the thing i do the most and and the thing i'm kind of closest to now but coming into producing uh was a journey i didn't even know what it was in fact I was introduced to the idea in a song meeting. I was working with a girl named Tiffany uh, who goes by Plum. And she was a huge part of my early days as a producer. I used to guitar, she was singing. It was really simple. This is years before you could do uh, easy tracks. You know, this yeah. is years before even like, recording on a computer basically. I mean, Pro Tools was out, but there were like, you could record like four tracks at a time or eight tracks. Which is wild time. because like the, like, I know you say producer first, but you know, you're starting where you're at right now. The term producer, everything that encompasses it now is completely different than back then. Like producer now is like, you're a mixer, you're a master, you're a singer, you're a songwriter, you're, you're everything. Like you can't just be like a producer, like back in the day. Agreed. And yeah. And, and, um, you know, and let's talk about that in a minute because I, I have some feelings about that too. But back then, and like what you're talking about, what the producer was doing was really providing vision for each song, for the project, for the artist. So we're sitting in this song, you know, songwriting meeting or this song meeting where uh, we're playing the songs for the A&R guy. And after every song, I would talk about them because I, you know, I felt a little weird. It's like we're playing this song on, I'm playing it on an acoustic. But in my head, I'm hearing the drums, I'm hearing the guitars, I'm hearing beats, like all this kind of different stuff. And I wanted to impart that to the a &R guy. So after every song, we would talk about what the song would actually sound like once it was recorded. Get to the end of the session and the a &R guy looks at me, his name is Robert Beeson, really lovely guy who, who gave me a huge shot early on. He's like, Matt, have you considered producing this project? And I didn't even know what that meant. Uh, I, and, and it was just because he kind of showed me that that's what producing was really all about, especially at that time, was casting some kind of a vision for the song, you know, and, and then being able to implement it. That's the other side of it. It's like what production truly is, is not only just the vision, but, you know, taking the dollars that they give you, if that's, you know, this is back that's, in the old days. Yeah, well, that, that's huge. Like, like, it's the same thing with movies as well. Like everyone... I know I've talked to people who don't work in the film industry and they're like, well, what does a producer actually do? And like, they're the people who take, like take the vision of everything. They get the people, they take that budget and they just find the people that need to work on it. So like, that's what a producer is. And that's, that's very much what a producer, even in the music industry is, is the person who creates the vision and like you said, implement it versus now yeah. it's everything. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, you know, producing is kind of creative alchemy, except it's in reverse. It's like in alchemy, you're taking stones and turning them into gold. In creative alchemy, you're taking gold, you know, i.e. the money from the label and turning it into songs, you know, or to your point earlier, into a movie or whatever, whatever creative kind of product. So it's, it's kind of a reverse alchemy. <laughs> yeah. And I, but I yeah, so, oh, no continue well I was, I was just gonna say like you know so back then uh you know they did they they handed me a pot of gold you know we had a decent budget for this first plum record um i was co-producing with uh dan who was the lead singer of jars that i knew from back then uh so there was a comfort level we were both very new to what that looked like dan had more experience in the studio than i did but we both understood creatively what we wanted to try and do and so we uh jumped in and and did that first record and it was a huge huge learning curve especially on the budget side uh, it was really difficult back then because you had very expensive studios that were cost you thousands upon thousands every day and you had a limited budget so you were trying to like pre-plan okay we have 10 days we have five days we have whatever uh and inevitably you would end up with the last two or three days in the studio where you were just running 24 seven, maybe sleeping on the couch for a few hours, getting up, having people come in because, you know, once you were out of the studio, that was it. Like you didn't have the ability to go to like some 
home studio and continue things, you really needed to do your entire job while you were in that paid studio. That's, that's kind of wild. So like, did you, did you find that, um, did you find that that actually helped or hindered it? Because it's kind of one of those things where I, like I do that now like in the production side where I'll bounce tracks. Like I'll be like, I like this sound, I'm committing to it right now and I'll bounce it. So that way I don't keep going back. Is that kind of like the same way that you guys did it? You're like, okay, like you kind of went on a gut feeling for it and you're like, we're, you know what, uh, this sounds really good. Uh, let's just take it and go because one, we don't really have the time to sit back and second guess. It's like, this feels good in the moment, like make it visceral. Or did you feel like it hindered more? Yeah, I mean, I don't have this quote on hand, but whatever that quote is about, you know, essentially saying creative projects aren't finished, they're abandoned. And I think that's kind of what would happen in the studio environment is that um, you just had a fixed timeline. I mean, you had to just like wherever you were, you got it as you got it to the best point you could, and then you were done. And I would say there's a double edged sword because these days, um, I think it can be difficult sometimes for everyone, myself included, to know when you're simply making something different as opposed to improving it, you know? So that would occur in the studio. It's like we had this paid studio. Um, generally, you bar barely got into that point. I mean, you didn't usually have so much time that you were just making things different. You know, you were generally improving, or at least that was the hope. But nowadays, when you have this home studio environment, you know, I could sit in here and tinker on something for for years if I wanted to. I mean, am I making it any better? You know, maybe, but maybe not even enough so that it would matter to the end kind of user consumer listener. Um, so I think there's good and bad. I mean, the bad back in the day was that you probably had to let some stuff go that you were not entirely happy with. You're like, you know what, we could have used one more day cutting drums. We could have used one more day cutting vocals. These days, it's the opposite. It's like, uh, oh, wow, you know, I'm, I'm going, I, I should have finished this three weeks ago. You know, like, I'm, I'm spinning my wheels here. Like, people are asking for changes that are unnecessary. I think mm. that's the other side of it. Now, I'd rather have this. I'd rather have the thing where I can go in and continue to uh, tinker on it and, and try some new ideas. Uh, I'm more, uh, I find that to be a more open environment in which to like explore some things. Um, but there, there's definitely a double-edged sword there. Do you, do you feel like the reason why you like it better now, um, is because, uh, like for what you've been doing for years, like you always put yourself as Matthew Bronley. I mean, you've worked on things from, uh, Sam Tenez, who, if people yep. don't know, he, sync is a big thing right now sync is a very big thing right now and you and sam and ruel and the tommy prophets you kind of like pioneered uh for lack of better words and mozella um pioneered that whole artistry that is made for sync but is still made for artists do you feel like that because you're in a uh position of always trying to push it to the next level that's why you like having the ability of time and tinkering or you know have you have you ever worked yeah. on a song so much that you go man i worked on that for like three weeks solid but i i liked the first version we did better but now i'm so far back that i can't really do anything about it <laughs> um you know, I, I definitely have gone back to version one on some things. Uh, I would say less so these days than than in the past, but there's, you know, I, I mean, I try to hold it all pretty loosely, especially my time. In fact, I think back in the day when you were paying for it, you felt more beholden to what you'd paid for. So for example, let's say that I played a rough guitar part on a song, but then I pay thousands of dollars for some pro to come in and replace it. And then I listen back later and I'm like, you know what, there was some weird magic in that first scratch guitar that I did that I have to jettison this other thing. That felt harder because they were like, you paid all this money for this person. And along with that came this expertise that you're like, surely that's better. And, and you really began to second guess. Um, so that, you know, that was really caught up in that. These days, uh, I feel like that time allows you to, what it, what it kind of allows you to do 
is to push things to the next level in, in spite of not having budget. So, you know, if I'm going in with, I mean, all the people you talked about, especially it's like with, with Sam and with Maggie, with the Ruel stuff and Flurry and others, it's like, uh, when we go in, we're not handed a budget by anybody, you know? Do we put money into it? Yeah, sometimes we do to get like real strings and a proper, you know, mix with somebody that we're really inspired by or, or whatever. Uh, but because we don't have some like, uh, you know, dump truck of gold being like offloaded to us, um, we don't have the ability sometimes to get like the like $10,000 mixer or the London Symphony Orchestra or whatever. And so what time in the studio and the home studio allows for us to do is to be able to explore some ideas, to tinker with stuff, to try and experiment uh, in order to try to graduate things into a level that does sound expensive, you know, that does sound kind of uh, more professional. I love that you bring up the London Symphony because I don't know if many people know this about you because again, you you work behind the scenes, like you're kind of like the wizard behind the curtain. Uh, but you've worked with the London Symphony before. I think twice, correct? I have, yeah. And you know, it's, I, I think that um, <clears throat> there is something to working with real strings. I mean, I remember the first time I heard real strings, I was, you know, I was in college and we went to St. Louis to go see the symphony orchestra there. And it's a great symphony orchestra. It's, it's a, one of the noted ones in the country. And we went in, I just remember the first song when the violin struck up, I was like, whoa, I was sitting in literally the last row, like the last row of the balcony and the sound just hit me. And I was like, oh. I mean, I just knew, I, you know, I grew up listening to like John Williams and all the Star Wars stuff and whatever. And I, I always loved, loved symphony strings, et cetera. Um, and so that was really gratifying. So then to work, you know, in the same, with the same kind of environments and people and orchestra and whatever that like uh, were part of these major motion pictures uh, was awe-inspiring and definitely got me thinking more about orchestration. And, and I don't consider, I mean, I'm a honestly just a terrible orchestrator, but I do hear melodies and things and, and I love trying to work I mean, I think what I love trying to do is to take orchestration and marry it with pop sensibilities. And so, you know, you talk about like the, I don't think of myself as like any kind of pioneer, but I do think there were a few of us, you know, let's say five years ago or whatever, that were beginning to see uh, that for the first time we could create these symphonies kind of at home mm -hmm. and, and they worked. Like for the first time, the sounds were so good that we could marry up, you know, pop melodies and singing, whatever, with this bit of orchestration. And you did see kind of a, a tidal shift in, in maybe what had been considered film and TV, which was oftentimes uh, either, you know, B-sides of an album, singer songwritery kind of stuff, more introspective, like the noted kind of film and TV people uh, were more singer songwriter types back in the early aughts, you know? But that changed, and so now film and TV music, well, it's all over the it's all over the place. But uh, for trailers, especially and things like that, you will see this marriage of orchestration with beats, with you know pop singers I, and, and whatnot. Oh my God, yes. Uh, have you seen the trailer for Spirit Untamed, the the kids movie? I don't think I have. There is a so it's actually a great story. There is a producer. I can't remember his name that did a cinematic version of Taylor Swift's Wildest Dreams, like super trailer, super epic. And he put it like, it, this is like four years ago. And it blew up on YouTube and all that. And it got in this trailer. And I'm, I'm not kidding. This might be one of the greatest trailer placement songs I've ever heard. Because it, it, wow. it's Taylor's version, because it's all her vocals. But you want to talk about epic and hits you in the chest. And it, you know, it's a dude, it, I think it was a dude from Turkey literally a dude from turkey and i think he made like 150,000 wow. from it like obviously taylor got the most out of it but him just taking this sound in his bedroom and i, I think he was like 17 wow like I'm, I'm talking like i i remember watching it with my wife the the first time i saw that trailer and i looked at her i'm just like oh my god this might be, <laughs> like I, I literally thought it was one of the like one of the best trailer placements i've ever heard and it was wow. just some 17 year old kid from turkey turning Taylor Swift's uh, Wildest Dreams into this like 
un like I love it better than the original version. Wow. It's it's epic. It really is. Like if you ever I'll, I'll send it I'll send you a text after this. Yeah, you, got it, you, you, got it. you will you will love it. Well, and you know, I think that's what the kind of you know laptop studio, home studio environment has done. It's this, you know, we have the democratization of music production occurring where like somebody who maybe never would have had the shot to do something like that all of a sudden now has the ability to to take something and run with it so you know and and it's a double-edged sword too because it's like you have you know a, a lot of people uh who are fledgling producers and whatnot putting stuff out there and and yeah is it like you know i mean i don't know how many songs are uploaded to like spotify every day it's some insane 60, number thousand I mean, it's just, it's insane. But, and how many of those are, are really great songs? Like, you know, probably, probably not a high percentage, but it's like, you've got all these people that are learning the craft uh, kind of in real time. You know, it's like they're producing stuff, writing songs, whatever, putting it out there and then kind of graduating through the levels. I think a lot of times back in the, back in the day, back in my day, it's like that was done behind the scenes or maybe you'd never have the shot. You know, you'd never have the opportunity to yeah. kind of get there. The gates were so narrow. And now the gates are like open wide. What's wild about these bedroom producers is there are some people that I've heard that are like, like you said, fledgling, like six months into it. And I'm in a lot of sync groups and you've probably heard a lot of people like do it. And they're like, yeah, I've been producing for like 15 years. And you listen to it and you're like, yeah, I know you recorded this like real drums, real guitar on like analog gear. But man, it does you, like for 15 years, you should be a lot farther than you are. And then you hear this kid who's six months in, and he's like, Yeah, I spent like six and a half, <laughs> like my, like spent these last six and a half months watching YouTube videos and absolutely crushing it. And because I, I listen to some of these ones all the time, and I'm just like, Man, like, how, like, how did you spend 15 years and like it, th the balance isn't there? And there, I, I feel like it, it's one of those things where like, the learning curve now is just be great or don't like it's it's so weird and some wow. like some people just can like watch youtube and you know i don't I, like i don't want to pat myself on the back but for how long i've been producing uh man i i feel like i've made greater strides than friends that i know i've been producing for years and it's just because like some people have the drive to want to learn and be great and others are just like, well, I have all the gear, so like I should be good. Yeah, well, it's you know, it's different, but I, I liken it to a little bit that scene in Goodwill Hunting where Matt Damon, you know, basically kind of like shows that the library is is the university. You know, like er everything is now out there. Like if you have access to YouTube and libraries and whatever, like all the information is there. But to your point, it's like it takes somebody with some drive, uh, who's gonna put some time into it, who's gonna put some effort into it. It does, you know, it's not through osmosis. Like you have to still put in the hours, you know, spend time in Logic or Pro Tools or whatever you're using. You have to implement all the things you're kind of learning. But yeah, I mean, it's so different. Cause it's like, when I was coming up, it's like you had to really go to some university uh, that had some kind of a program uh, where you were in a studio environment and you learned all that. It was very technical skills too. I mean, these days using all the different things on the computer, it feels maybe no different than any other task you might do on a computer. But back in the day when you had this very daunting like SSL board and all this external gear, uh, it felt like you had to have, you know, I mean, the, they called it engineering. It's, you know, your studio engineer. And I don't think that word was used lightly because it was like, it was a lot of kind of math involved. You know, there was a lot of like logic to putting everything to kind of together. And these days you can kind of feel your way through it. You may not even know how a compressor works, but you may know if you put a compressor on the channel and do certain things, it sounds good and EQ. And then, then you go to YouTube and you watch for a few hours and you're like, somebody's like, hey, here's how to EQ a vocal. And you just like, okay, like you copy and then you kind of figure away from there. So yeah, it's just it's such a different thing now. Man, it 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 really is because I mean I'm I'm that dude you're talking about. Like I am so much of using my like like the studio bro who's just like, why does my mix sucks? Use your ears, bro. 
uh, I am use my ears and all that. And I've probably blown you up with songs all the time where I'm like, does this suck? Like, here's what I'm doing. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I really like, I still feel like most of the time I don't really know what a compressor is doing or how I'm EQing. I just kind of like feel it out and do it. And I, you know, I think for me personally, I feel it makes it more musical instead of technical like i feel more creative when i'm just like kind of feeling it out and being like well what if what if, what happens if i do this instead of like oh i you know i don't need like 60 hertz in this or i don't need like i need to go sweep these frequencies or you know my ratio is off on my compressor it's like you no know, does that feel good does that sound good and does the song feel good okay cool move on it feels more yeah. creative and musical that way yeah and you know i i, I don't want to discount the knowledge, because I think the knowledge is powerful. And I, I think it's just the usage that's important. You know, I, you know, I've got some screenwriter friends and they were talking, you know, I love to talk about um, story structure. But one thing, you know, I was talking to a director friend of mine and he mentioned, he's like, hey, story structure is not the thing you start from. It's the thing you implement afterward in order to fix the problems. Write the story, you know, like write the story emotionally figure it out and then but then like later on if you're like gosh this just isn't working you can then implement some of that story structure in order to, to figure out why a beat isn't hitting right same thing with like all these things it's like you can get you can get very far down the road without knowing and you can get all the way down the road without knowing any of it but you might come to an impasse you might come to a place where you're like hey something isn't working in the mix and then you talk to like some pro mixer and he's like well, dude, he's like, you've got, uh, you've got all these low frequencies building up on every channel. Why don't you like put a high pass on these channels and like open up some room in this area, this and that. Like there are to solve problems, but I think what people do sometimes is, is they start from that technical side and then get in the weeds creatively uh, rather than the reverse. Cause I mean, a creative solution is usually gonna win. You know, I mean, a, mm. A, a killer song um, recorded poorly will will probably do better than like a, a terrible song recorded perfectly. <laughs> you know, I mean, we've seen that play out. I'm not yeah. making that up. It's like I mean, we've seen that happen. Yeah, we're seeing it right now with all these bedroom producers. And I and I think like when you when you say it like that, it really does. Because uh, I agree with you 100. percent And I think that's the difference between a producer and because we talked about it earlier about like. A producer needing to be like everything a mixing mass blah, blah 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 that's when you need those people who are so good with frequencies so good at what they do that you know a lot of people think that because like especially in sync they're like i need to have like all these songs done i'm like for me i'd rather you know you know record four fantastic songs and then pay a mixing engineer who is badass at what he does get those sounding perfect because I know that if I write these songs great and I produce them great and then get them mixed and mastered great, those four songs will do better than somebody who's just trying to crank out, you know, 150 songs that year that are like subpar. And yeah, I mean, you know, I, I just, I just think it's, it's different for different people. I mean, you know, I think we talked about this, but I, I know a guy who literally would write three to 400 songs a year and another guy who wrote 12 songs a year and their incomes may have been, equal you know so you know who was right you know throw up your hands in the air because it's like you're just not going to figure it out everybody's got some kind of different way of operating for some people that's the only way they can arrive at the solution is like the magnitude of work that they produce mm -hmm. for somebody else it's the magnitude of the quality you know it's like and and either one can work you know it's like either one of those can work i will say I did read one time something about, um, they kind of just looked at creativity in general and they did find that for those people who would be considered the masters, the greats in, in uh, myriad areas, you know, be it music, film, whatever, most of them had a very high uh, productivity quotient kind of early in life. You know, they usually did put churn out a lot of stuff. And so I do think there's maybe something to be said, especially in the early days um, of just like taking as many shots as you can, you know, but then once you kind of graduate into a place where you're like, you know what, I can spend a little bit more time. Like, I feel really good about this. I need to refine it a bit more. Um, you know, I, I think you see that evolution happen with most people creatively. 
No, I think that's that 10,000 hours thing too. Yeah, I mean, I was like, I'm like 10,000 hours is truly like nothing. Like, <laughs> I mean, I know that that's the Gladwell saying and it's like, I'm not saying he's wrong. He's completely right. But it's like the 10,000 hours is like the starting line. You know, it's like, I don't even know how many hours you get to where like people who are truly like, you know, amazing at their craft get to, but it's, it's a lot. It's a million hours or whatever. Yeah. Man, Matthew, I really appreciate the time and talking and all that. I know you are a really busy guy. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll probably wrap it up here in a little bit, but I, you know, yeah. before, before we go, I, I want to ask you two more questions. Uh, one is yeah. what it, for anybody listening, whether it be a songwriter, producer, or somebody in the industry at all, what would be your favorite piece of advice? Not the best advice, but your favorite piece of advice you could give someone. Well, I think, you know, I'll maybe speak to people who are doing what I do. And I, and I want to go back to maybe something you said kind of early on, which is like the role of the producer and how that's changed and evolved. You know, now we kind of use the term track guy. You know, I would be considered kind of a track guy. So that has been become a bit synonymous with producer. And so the expectation is if, a, if an artist walks in the door is that I will create the track, right? It's like, I'll create the beats and the music or somehow, even if I'm like using other people to create the final product, somehow I'm the one kind of in charge of that. But I think, you know, going back to when I started, uh, the role of the producer was oftentimes to be kind of the visionary. And to be this person to be able to uh, carry out this plan. And it was usually, I mean, it was a plan that you came together with through some kind of consensus with the artist. You know, it might be largely like what the artist was trying to do, but they didn't have the means uh, to be able to kind of get to the end of the street with it. And so you were the one like kind of, you know, tasked with making that happen. So I think, I think the only thing that I see sometimes is that I see the, some modern producers, young producers who are track guys, but they're not producers. And what I mean is that like, can they throw together a beat? Sure. Can they grab some stuff off splice and put it together? Sure. But do they understand like what they're trying to put out into the world? No. Like what is the underlying emotion? What is the underlying story? How can they help the artist get to uh, a more elevated place with their craft, with their singing, with their w whatever it is. Um, and so that's the part that like, I feel really passionate about and I feel really passionate about trying to stoke the flames with like young producers and songwriters and everything with like, just thinking about that part of it, you know, cause oftentimes it's like the lyric needs to be edited a little bit. The melodies could be pushed into a better place the just thinking through like when for the person on the other end who's clicking you know play on spotify what experience do you want for them i mean you hear this on shark tank all the time right it's like somebody walks in and they've got some cool new product and then mark cuban is like listen you're not selling a widget you're selling an experience and this like you know light bulb goes off in the head of the person who's selling the widget I think it's no different with music. We oftentimes forget that the minute somebody hits play on a song, we're sending them on some kind of roller coaster. It's a it's a ride. It's it's an experience. And so, uh, if it's just uh, the smacking together of like beats and and guitar and whatever, it's not enough. It's like there's there's got to be kind of a reason for it. So I think I think that's the thing is I, I'd love to impart for some. Uh, you know, let's all be more mindful and thoughtful about what we're creating. I love that. I love that. Because we, we talk about that all the time. And my last question is, uh, what do you want to let people know that you're working on right now? Oh, boy. Um, too many things. <laughs> I don't even know that I have anything to point people to in particular. I'd say just like, you know, get ready for some fun stuff coming up next. Wonderful. Matthew, I appreciate your time so much. You are a great mentor, not just to me, but so many other people. Uh, your insight and your knowledge is invaluable. I appreciate you. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Everybody, that was Matthew Bronlewy on the Outsiders Insiders podcast. Thanks.